All right, actually, we should say Happy Resurrection Sunday. So excited to celebrate the greatest event that has ever happened in history, the resurrection of Jesus. God raising Jesus from the dead. Offering, yes, someone's excited about that today. Offering salvation, eternal salvation. And this morning I was thinking about the word salvation, and many of you have heard me say this. It means preservation, healing, deliverance, wholeness, complete restoration. So we get to celebrate all that today because that's what was made available, not just for when we get to heaven, but right now while we're on this earth. And so even this morning, again, I was just thanking God again for what he's provided for me, that I can walk with him and talk with him, that he loves me, and I can experience a life with him. But today I want to talk to you about experiencing a resurrected life. And that's the title of the message today, Experiencing a Resurrected Life. So turn to your neighbor and say, A Resurrected Life. Turn to someone else and say, a resurrected life. Some of you are saying, I need some resurrection this morning. So the word to resurrect or resurrect means to raise from the dead, to bring to life again, but I like this one, to bring back into use. So in the days of Jesus, those who encountered him were literally brought back to life again. Sometimes, literally, others, they were sick, like really, really sick, deathly sick. They were brought back to life again. Some, they were rejected, cast out by society, forgotten, and Jesus brought them back into use again. The thing is, he's still doing that today. He's not changed his mind. He still offers us to live and experience a resurrected life. Maybe you're here today, and you need something brought back into use. Maybe there's something in your life that needs to have some life breathed into it. Well, I'm going to ask you to stay very open and aware of what God is doing today because he wants to resurrect some things in our lives. So this is not a time where you just kind of sit back and watch because we're going to be looking at some characters in the word of God who encountered Jesus and experienced a resurrection experience. And literally the encounter change the course of their life. And how did it change the course of their life? Well, he offered them something better. They accepted it. Their heart was changed, and then history was made. So let's get our hearts ready to receive what God's going to do today. I have such an expectancy. Do you have an expectancy today that God wants to do some new things? So let's say this with all of your heart. Today, today. I will hear the voice of God. Through the, Through the Word of God, my eyes will be enlightened. Will be enlightened. I, will be I will be changed. Now turn to your neighbor, look him square in the eye and say, I will be changed. Will be changed. And turn to another neighbor and say, I will be changed. All kinds of fun things happen in the presence of God. So I, I feel like a child in a canyon or just excited about what God is going to do today. So the first person that we're going to look at, she doesn't even have a name. She's called the woman of Samaria, or other uh, translations of the word call it the woman at the well. And the, the scripture says that she was drawing water in the middle of the afternoon, which is not common. You don't draw water in the afternoon. You usually draw water in the morning because it's just so hot in the afternoon. So this gives us a clue, and we find out later why she's drawing water in the afternoon. We see later in the scriptures that she had been divorced five times. Now, she didn't divorce her husbands. They divorced her because they weren't allowed back then to do that. The men did it. So this is a woman who has been rejected, abandoned, forgotten. She does not want to be with any crowds of people because back then you were shunned, it was shameful, and uh, spit upon, jeered at. So she's kind of like, I'm just going to kind of blend in or not be around people. And I believe that she had conversations that went on in her mind that basically said, I'm done. There's no way to regain what I've lost. And so this particular day, she's out drawing water, and uh, Jesus is there. And it's interesting 
the scripture talks about, before, before we actually get in, this, in that portion of scripture where he's actually at the well, it says that he wanted to go to Galilee, Jesus. And it literally said, and he needed to go through Samaria. Now, there's other ways to get to Galilee, but why did he have to go through Samaria? Because there was a woman there that desperately needed a touch from God, and God found her worthy to be touched, valuable and significant. So he's there, and he starts up a conversation with her, and this is freaking her out. Because Jews do not talk to Samaritans. It's kind of like uh, these two people groups, they hated one another. You're t- I'm talking racial wars going on here. So she, he starts up a conversation with her, and Jesus knows that she has been divorced five times. He knows all her mistakes. Did you know that God knows all of your mistakes? It's like, you know, you try to hide. No, 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 he knows everything. And he's sitting there talking to her, and in the middle of this conversation, he offers her something better, a better life, a new beginning, a new direction, a better purpose. And this woman, I I can just imagine her saying, are you kidding me? And I think this is interesting too. Jesus chose this woman this forgotten, forsaken, who made so many mistakes, chose her to be the very first person recorded to reveal himself as the Messiah. I thought that was so wonderful. And so she accepts it. Why did she accept it? Because she saw in his eyes that he valued her. He looked her in the eye and accepted her. She saw significance in his eyes. And her heart was changed by his unconditional love. This woman went on, history says that she actually went on with her kids to evangelize. She was a forerunner. She was a part of that group of people that went out and spread Christianity. God offered her something better. She accepted it, and Jesus altered the course of her life. And he's still doing that. He's still altering the course of people's lives. And then there's another guy. His name is Levi. Now, Levi, another interesting character, he was a tax collector. And tax collectors back in the day, they were so hated, so, so hated. In fact, they were considered the worst of the worst sinners, Nobody hung out with tax collectors. If, if you were a tax collector, the only people you hung out with were other tax collectors. That's it. You were called the scum of the earth, spit upon, jeered, kind of like the woman of Samaria, but even worse. Even worse. And so Levi and his name, now, now why were they hated? Because what the tax collectors would do is obviously they collected taxes, but they would charge over and above an exorbitant amount of money to the people in order to line their own pockets. And so if they couldn't pay, they were enslaved, they were put in jail. So in a nutshell, these tax collectors destroyed people's lives. Literally. I don't even know how they could, how they could even sleep at night with the people that they hurt. So now Levi, his name, reveals something about this particular character. Levi had come from a priestly home. Um, a modern day like PK kid. He came from a pastor's house, raised in a pastor's home, if that can help us relate to him. And somewhere along the way, we don't know why, somehow he turned his back on his faith, on his family, on his heritage, on everything that he knew. Turned his back on it. And we don't know the reasons why. Oh, there's all kinds of reasons why we turn our back on God. I think one of the number one reasons why people don't uh, receive Christ or turn their back on God is they really don't know him. They've not truly understood the depth of his love. Because I don't know, whenever I receive love from anybody, from anybody, I can't help but go towards them. So here Levi is a tax collector, and this one particular day, he's collecting taxes as he always does. And the Bible says that there was this crowd that was following Jesus, And Jesus comes up to him. And you have to realize, I come to this conclusion because of what he does with Jesus. Levi came to the point, like the woman of Samaria, where there is no way 
to ever regain what I've lost. There is no way I'm lost. And even though Levi heard a lot of testimonies about various people that were being healed because it was going crazy back then of what Jesus was doing to people's lives. But he determined within himself, he was exempt from ever, ever, ever being restored. In his mind, he could never experience a resurrected life. And I know a lot of people that have been there. No, I'm too far gone. There is just no way. And I believe the reason why we've got these characters written in the word of God, it's for you and I. It really is. So this one day, Jesus, he walks up to, to, to Levi, and there's a crowd of people and his 12 disciples. Now listen, even his 12 disciples, they were in a process. They didn't like tax collectors either. We think that they were just so holy and walking on air. No, they were human beings just like you and I and had issues just like you and I, and they were in a process. So Jesus walks up to Levi, and he says to him, follow me. Two words. Follow me. Personally, I believe that he began to look around him like, who, who, who are you talking to? Are you really looking at me? Me? And I believe he saw in Jesus' eyes, absolutely, Levi, follow me. And I could see his disciples going, Jesus, do you know who he is? Are you, are you serious? I mean, I know you love people, but him? And the Bible says he literally left everything. I mean, piles of money standing right there. Left everything and began to follow him. Jesus offered him something better. And he saw in his eyes hope, significance, value, and he hadn't seen that in a long time. He accepted it. God changed his heart. What I love about this man, he was one of the 12 that changed the world. Levi? He wrote one of the books of the Bible. What? Jesus altered the course of his life. There's a scripture in John 10, 10. It's a familiar scripture. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who is the thief? It's Satan. In fact, there's another scripture that says that Jesus, for this reason, the Son of God, Jesus, was manifested to destroy the works of Satan. The things that Satan does to people, destroying their lives. And Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy your life. No, 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 no. I came that you would have life. You would experience the kind of life you were supposed to have. And not just a life, but an abundant life. I believe that Jesus is still resurrecting lives. He offers it. But will we accept it? Watch this testimony. I was born into a rough family situation. I was born into a poor family. My dad was always working and my mother, she made my father do everything for us and he couldn't take it, so we moved in with our grandparents. In eighth grade, my mother set me up with a 19-year-old. I was 13. He abused me mentally and physically for eight months. And um, he told me that God wanted us together and God would punish me if I left him. So I, I eventually did leave him because I couldn't handle it. I tried committing suicide three times. My family took me to David Lawrence Center. They diagnosed me with paranoia, social anxiety, depression. At where I was, I never thought it would get better. Since I was told that God wanted me to be with a man that was inspiring so much fear in my life, I didn't want to follow God anymore. So. I became a Satanist and I gave everything to Satan because that's all I knew. I turned to drugs and alcohol and I was smoking weed before school and after school. I eventually came to school after crying on my bed one night because I couldn't take it anymore. I, I came to this church and they had their arms wide open and welcomed me like I was meant to be there. And, I was still shaky and nervous from meeting new people and I was still really afraid of men, but 
I came back because I love being in the presence of God. I love being here with these people who just accepted me. Like I've never done anything wrong, like I was perfect. And I learned that everything I heard about God was wrong. <laughs> Before I came to God, I was doing drugs and I was drinking, I was failing, my grades were slipping, and I was hanging out with the wrong crowd, partying. But now I, I have so many blessings, straight A student. I have a great GPA, colleges are sending me letters and emails all the time and I have scholarships flying in, stuff I never expected to see happen. I know that now when I'm going through the struggles and the hardships of life that I can turn to God and I can just be in His comfort and His embrace when things are rough, He's there and He's lifting me up and it's really amazing to have that now. I used to be depressed but now I have happiness that God's given me. It's one of His biggest blessings that I've ever received. Isn't that awesome? I mean, I've seen that testimony how many times, and I'm still a mess every time I see it. That, that's what Jesus does. He resurrects things. He resurrects and gives us new life. And that's what's so exciting about a relationship with him. Now, a lot of us, were familiar with the healing ministry of Jesus. And I say that because a lot of the movies that are made about, you know, whether it's the Passion of Christ, even some of the newer ones, we generally see Jesus healing people. And, you know, they're miraculous and it's amazing. And um, that was one, Jesus, he would teach and then he would heal. In Acts 10.38, it says this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. And then another scripture in Matthew, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming, I love this, the good news. It wasn't bad news. It wasn't judgment. It wasn't God's going to get you. It's the good news that wherever you are, it can be better. The good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And, he, and later on, he actually tells his disciples to go out and do the same thing. And he's continuing to heal people today. He does it through now those who are his. He's still healing. He's still setting people free. He's still resurrecting lives. So there was this, this man. He had a, a, a horrible, incurable sickness. It was called leprosy. And leprosy, it was a painful disease, a slow, painful disease where parts of your body would eventually just fall off. Now, in this, in this particular, this kind of disease, you could not be in community. You could not be with people. So you actually had to live outside of the city, and you had this camp just for lepers. So now, and, and you couldn't be because you could catch it if, if you were touched. So now to even be in public, if you were caught, sometimes in those earlier stages, you, you could literally be stoned. So this man, he's a leper. The Bible says he came seeking Jesus. Let's read about it. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. I think a lot of people say that. Are you willing? I mean, I know you've healed that person and maybe that person, but me? How about me? And, and back then there was this belief that was circulated that if, you're, if you had some kind of a sickness in you, there must be some hidden sin, there must be something, and it was God's judgment. That's what they would believe back then, and it was, that was not the truth. Sickness is a product of, it is a product of sin, it's just a product of being of the fallen world. Sickness is just an offshoot of sin, it's fruit, a child of sin. That's why Jesus came to deal with the sin issue, and all the fruit gets taken care of. So, he says, if you're, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And I love what Jesus does. Jesus reaches out his hand. Now listen, there hadn't been a person in who knows how long that even attempted to reach out and touch this man. And I believe this man, he sees his hand go up like this. And he goes, oh my God, he is willing. He's going to touch me. Hope. 
And what is it? What is it? What does it say here? He 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 he, he, he reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said. I am willing. No doubt about it. If it's crossed your mind, I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. So I was meditating and I am willing. If he said it one time, just one time, he means it every time. He's as constant as the sun coming up every single morning, as the tides come in every single day. He's as constant as that. And today he's saying, I am willing. I've not changed my mind. Religion says, well, if it be thy will. But that's not what he said. He said, I am willing because he doesn't heal based on your behavior. He doesn't heal based on you earning anything. He heals based on his love for you. Not based on your perfection. The Bible says it's by grace we're saved. It's by grace we're healed. It's the same. He said, I am willing. And Jesus is still willing today. He's still resurrecting physical bodies today. Watch this video. Eh, me tocaba hacerme un chequeo normal, un chequeo cotidiano. Me hicieron una mamografía simple y pensé que el resultado iba a ser normal. Y me dijeron, hemos visto que en tus exámenes hay una anormalidad. Necesitamos que te hagas una biopsia. Y allí ellos me mostraron por las pantallas el tamaño de, de la masa que yo tenía en, en mi seno izquierdo. Una masa que tenía 5 por 3 milímetros, se veía la imagen, yo vi y, y me mostraban otras, otras cosas que rodeaban esa masa. Un tiempo que, que comenzó aquí en la iglesia los 21 días de oración. El último viernes eh, de, de, los, de esos 21 días, yo vine acá, le dije a mi esposa, yo voy a estar allá en el cierre de los 21 días de oración junto, junto a la pastora Tracy. Y estando acá reunidos en la iglesia, Hubo un, una atmósfera de milagro, una atmósfera de sanidad y allí mi espíritu me llevó a orar por, por la salud de mi esposa. Esa palabra que con fe la hemos declarado tantas veces, que Él es nuestro médico por excelencia, que Él llevó las enfermedades de la cruz y yo reclamé la sanidad de mi esposa estando ella en casa. Yo pude sentir que mi esposa, aun que no estaba acá físicamente, ella estaba siendo sanada en la casa. Y cuando terminamos la oración, cuando terminó el tiempo acá en la iglesia, yo me fui temblando al, al carro, manejando a casa. Cuando llegué a la casa, abrí la puerta y lo primero que le dije, tengo que hablar contigo. Y yo le dije, te vas a hacer los exámenes porque debemos mostrar el testimonio de sanidad al Dios al que nosotros le servimos. Me fui a hacer la biopsia y después, de, después que terminaron de hacer la biopsia, me volvieron a hacer una mamografía. Me fui a mi doctor de cabecera y le pasé la biopsia con las imágenes y con el resultado. Y me dijo, como he confundido, y me dice, cuando te hicieron la biopsia, ¿te hicieron una extracción? Y le dije, no. Y me dijo, ¿estás segura no te hicieron una extracción? Le dije, eh, sí me hicieron una extracción. Jesús me hizo la extracción. Sirvo un Dios que me salve. <risa> Cuando yo le dije eso al doctor, él me dijo, cerró esto, está bien, vamos a dejar eso así, baja tu chequeo normal, porque no tienes nada. Nosotros hemos visto, primero vimos el milagro de la salvación, hace unos años vivimos el, el milagro de la restauración matrimonial, y hoy puedo testificar el milagro de sanidad, porque... Nuestro Dios es el mismo ayer, hoy y por siempre. I would say that they experienced a resurrected life. Amen. Keep yourselves open because he's resurrecting your life today too. I love how she said, it's such a great scripture. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He's not changed his mind, full of love and compassion. His love compelled him to leave heaven to come and save us. 
And his love is still compelling him. He's still merciful. He's still compassionate. And he's resurrecting lives. So a, a last story, and a last character that I want to talk about today. She doesn't have a name either. She's called the woman with the issue of blood. And the scripture shows that this woman, she basically was bleeding to death. The scripture talks about how she had spent all that she had on physicians, and she actually grew worse instead of better. Now, like a leper, when, when you have that kind of a condition, in that particular community, you were considered unclean. So you could not be in your community. So by this time of her life, and I want you to realize this, she can no longer be with her family. So she's lost her husband, she's lost her children, and now she's penniless. I would say that's a pretty dead situation, wouldn't you? So she hears about Jesus. And she hears about other people being healed. But when I study this out, the Lord took me to something a little bit different, that she heard about his message of love and acceptance and forgiveness. Because again, she was one of those people with that same belief system. There must be something wrong. There must be some sin. But she heard his message because it's interesting that Jesus was healing people. They weren't getting their life together, then getting healed. He healed them. Then he helped them get their life together. That's how it's supposed to be. We're so trying to change ourselves when you can't. That's why when you receive Jesus, he places his very own spirit in you. Because through his spirit, that's where the change comes. You give him your will, but it's his power. It's this incredible friend, the Holy Spirit, who does the change. That's why we're saved by grace, not by works. I'm so glad for that. So she hears about Jesus, and the scripture said that she, she goes to find where he's at. And uh, again, there's a crowd around Jesus. Have you ever been in a crowd? It's really loud. Really, really loud. People are screaming. And here, and she sees him. And, and, you know, she's weakened. And the Bible says that she pressed through the crowd. I don't know why, but, and maybe I read it somewhere, I think that she was actually crawling and just, you know, getting bumped and getting hit by all kinds of legs and robes and smelly feet. And, and I believe that she, she, she fixed her eyes on that robe and the Bible said this, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. And as I studied that out, she was saying it over and over to herself. If I could just, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. If I, will, if I, just, gotta, I just got to touch the garment. So finally, she pressed through. She touched it. And the Bible says immediately, she could feel everything just dry up on the inside of her. Now, on Jesus' end, now remember, he's got this crowd just all around him. And I believe, you know, he's walking, and he's got all, he has his entourage, he's got all his disciples. He's the rock star. Everybody wants to touch Jesus, right? Everybody's touching Jesus. But this is a little bit different. So, so he's walking, and I believe he's walking, and, you know, okay, uh, let's go a little bit further here. All of a sudden, I believe he went, Who touched me? And I could see Peter. The one who always put his foot in his mouth. Who touched you? Everyone? He said, mm 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 mm. Because the Bible says that he felt power leave him. Come on, say power. Power, power left him. And he's looking around like, and, and he didn't even know what was happening. Jesus? The son of God, he didn't see it coming because he said, who touched me? Something just happened. She determined the time and the place of her healing. Oh! And so she kind of goes, uh, uh, it was me in front of all of these people. And this is what Jesus says to her. And this is for you and I. He said to her, daughter, daughter, family, you're mine. I love you. That's what daughter means, family. 
your faith, your faith, your believing, your trusting. She obviously had to have faith to be pressing through that crowd. Your faith has made you well. Now, that word well is where we get the word zozo or salvation. Salvation. Your faith has, and that word salvation means preserved you, healed you, delivered you, made you whole completely, restored everything back to you. Now, there's a reason why he said that, because remember, she lost everything, her family, her children, and her wealth. And then he goes on to say, go in peace. Now, that's not the kind of peace that we think. That word peace in the original language means shalom. It means nothing missing, nothing broken in your life. That was good news to her because she lost everything. And then he says, and be healed of your affliction. Oh, all that in one verse. Why is that written for you and I? Because he comes to resurrect everything in our life if we let him. And so that's great. She has a restored family, a restored marriage, a restored body. And I think some of the hardest things to resurrect is a broken relationship. When a, when a relationship, a marriage comes to the point where, I mean, how do you start off so crazy in love and then all of a sudden you need attorneys to even talk to each other? So, the point of no return. But even in that, there is nothing impossible with God. He's a miraculous God. He can even heal and resurrect a broken marriage. Watch this. Ken and I got married in April of 2010. And it was, um, it was fantastic. We had a very good relationship in the very beginning. We we're best friends. And it kind of started to get very tense pretty quickly. Part of the biggest struggle that I had was alcohol. I'd come home and I'd five o'clock, I'd open a beer. I would drink beer after beer after beer after beer until it was bedtime. I was a miserable person. I hated who I was inside. I, that was my escape. I had kind of spiraled into a really deep depression. I had a lot of migraines and I started to abuse prescription drugs. My aggressions that I had at work and at home, they never stopped. I took them out on her 24 hours a day. He was getting more and more irritated with me, and um, I couldn't handle the uh, stress. So what I ended up doing was I had an affair. It was by far the hardest thing I'd ever had to swallow. He and I separated, and we filed for divorce. I wanted to drown myself in self-pity, and God wouldn't let it. He pulled me up and said, you're not doing this. You're going to be fine. And uh, that next day, I came home, and I threw every bit of alcohol away, every bit of it. After hearing Tracy, one of Tracy's sermons one day, I finally just hit my knees and said, OK, I'm giving you my heart because I know you're the only one that's not going to break it. What do you want me to do? Even though I was scared that he wouldn't want me back after everything that I had done, I was already forgiven for it. And I had to learn how to forgive myself. This church is what brought us back together. God pushed us here. We came here separately from each other, not together. The first time I met Pastor Tracy, she invited me to the men's group that Thursday night. And it just, it changed my life. You know, between my experience that I had with God, throwing the alcohol away, and then coming to church, I just, I was changed completely. I was taking a lot of pain pills around the clock, and um, I quit them all in one day, cold turkey. And to be honest with you, something like that, I should have put myself in the hospital. And he had just told me, he said, I can, I can help you do this, just believe me. And any time I would get a little side effect, I would just throw it by, right back to the pit of hell where it came from. And it was gone. You can do anything with God's help, anything. And I don't have any pain today. I, I don't have the problems that I had with focusing. Um, and it's, it's just incredible. And it was like God was working on both of us at the same time. 
but I didn't know he was working on her and she didn't know he was working on me. And, you know, I finally started to realize that we do this to each other. My wife didn't do this to me. You know, she had an affair because I drove her away. I, I stopped taking care of her. I stopped respecting her. I stopped treating her like a wife. There was a day coming into church. He came to the nine o'clock service. I came to the 11, 11 o'clock. And uh, one day I was walking out. She was walking in. He was holding our daughter. And God just told me, he said, invite him in. Of course I said yes, you know. Things just started to happen between us. And it, it was not easy at all. It was, it was hard to trust him, but I trusted God. So two days before Thanksgiving, we moved back in with each other. And then for Christmas, our gift to us and our family was to throw out our divorce papers. We were mean to each other and we only cared about ourselves. And now we spend all of our time together, whereas before we didn't spend any time together. And we still have issues. I mean, we're married, but we bring them to God. We pray over them. We, we can fix them so much easier now. Because we listened to what God had to say. He healed our marriage and it, he can fix us. He, he can, can fix he, anything. He can do anything. Isn't that so awesome? I just love how Jesus transforms lives. Transforms lives. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's so awesome. Jesus offers us a better life. The Bible says that he went about preaching good news. Good news. Today, he's offering you a better life. And maybe for some of you, the better life is, maybe you've just settled for a lesser quality of life, living in your own strength, in your own wisdom. And Jesus is saying, will you do life with me? Will you let me renew your purpose, your direction? Now remember, all of those people, they had to accept it. And then something happened to their heart. And maybe some of you, you're here and, and Jesus is saying to you, I'm offering you a new life. Maybe you've known religion. Maybe you've known about God. But today he's saying, I want you to know me personally. And he's offering you this morning a better life, a new life. Receiving him as your Lord and your Savior. It's the greatest miracle and actually, that's really why he died and resurrected for this moment right here. For people to literally be reconnected to Jesus, to the Father through Jesus, experiencing the kind of life we were supposed to have. I want to pray with you this morning. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, this is an incredible moment. As the woman with the issue of blood, as the woman of Samaria, as Levi, Jesus is saying, I've got a better life. Will you accept it? Will you give your heart fully to me? You see, the reason why he asks you for that, because he does not in any way invade our will. We have to welcome him. He's a perfect gentleman. And this morning, if you want to welcome him into your heart, for him to be your Lord and your Savior, to begin fresh and new today. I want to pray. And if you want to be included in this prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but quickly just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to receive Jesus. Quickly raise your hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Bless you, bless you, bless you. This is a miraculous moment. In receiving him, you're literally saying yes to spending all of eternity with him and living a life full of him, him leading, guiding, directing you, filling your life with purpose. This is a miraculous moment. So we're going to pray right now. And when we pray this prayer, mean it with all of your heart and allow God to do that miracle in you this morning. So say with me, Lord Jesus, 
I surrender my life to you right now. I acknowledge that you died for me. You loved me enough to die for me. I ask you, come into my heart, be my Lord, and be my Savior. Help me to live for you all the days of my life. I believe that today you are in me, and I am new, and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to continue to pray again with every head bowed, every eye closed. As we talked about and we saw it through the word and through the life of Jesus, and as you saw in the testimonies, that he is a healing God. He still heals today. And so if there's something physically going on in your body this morning, maybe you've gotten a doctor's report, maybe you, you came in here with pain, maybe you've just been told that you've got a tumor, maybe it's cancer or heart disease, whatever it is, it could just be a migraine. Maybe you've got some issues with your back, with your spine, it's just giving you a lot of issues. Whatever the case is this morning, let's open up our hearts. He's offering something really good right now, and all you need to do is receive. And if that's you, what I want you to do, you've got something physically going on in your body, just raise your hand and say, that's me. I need a healing touch from God. I see all of those hands. I see all those hands. Now I want you both to just lift both of your hands like you're receiving something from God as I pray. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, they're coming to you. They're not coming to a preacher. They're not coming to a church. They're coming to you, Jesus, like all of those in the word of God. And I thank you right now, Father, in Jesus' name, for healing every single person that raised their hand. Fill them, touch them. In the name of Jesus Christ, go to those secret places that no one can see and bring your healing miracles in their physical bodies. Now, in Jesus' name, I thank you and I praise you for filling, for touching, and for healing, for you are compassionate and you're merciful, and you are willing. And oh, we just give you praise right now for all that you're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for setting people free, spirit, soul, and body, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, come on, let's give God praise. Oh, I just praise you. I praise you.